who are together as we consider the second part of our concepts for today concerning wisdom and worship. Tonight I want to formulate my thoughts around a concept that I just sort of wonder, are you like me in this way? Here's what I'm thinking. Sometimes I'm reading events in Scripture and I'm thinking, what would have been, what it would have been like following the events with information that we've not been given? I started that one time and, and built a sermon around the idea of the soldier at the cross of Jesus. You remember when they gambled to see who would get his coat. And I imagined the soldier who won that coat. And he left that day with that coat. And he hung it in his closet. Did he ever have any other thoughts about that day every time he saw that coat? Now, there are things like that in Scripture that I just think about from time to time. And tonight, I'm going to frame my thoughts at the end with that same idea, saying, I just wonder. This morning we noticed the wise men who came to Jesus to worship. Maybe it wasn't clear, but probably the case is that no more than two years after his birth is when those wise men came. They didn't come while he was still in the manger. They came later, maybe as much as two years but we go now tonight to Luke chapter 2. And if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to that text, the passage that was read for us, and some verses around those verses, I want you to notice with me some thoughts concerning the shepherds who came to Jesus. This morning we notice that wise men still come, just like those wise men did. Wise men today still come. To worship Jesus. And my question tonight is, or the thought is, I wonder what happens today when wise men worship God. We're going to go into some things that happened with these shepherds. But first, let's discuss the big issue. I wonder, when was Jesus born? Well, I could make the first part of this outline and sermon real simple. Not December 25th. Simple. By the way, I think the outline is probably now up on Realm. And you need to look at that because it's much more detailed probably than I will go into in this lesson. But I lay it out there for you, a lot of things that go into understanding as best we can the time when Jesus was born. Just wasn't during the time that we're in right now and people are celebrating it. I said again this morning and continue to say, if you want to have a special day to remember the birth of Jesus, that's fine. But the Bible doesn't tell us the day. The Bible doesn't ask us to observe that day. But like any day, personally, you can choose to do it for yourself. But to be good Bible scholars, let's see if we can just understand a few things that help us to narrow down the day, if you will, that Jesus was born, probably. The text before us tells us that the shepherds came to the birth of Jesus at the manger during the time when they were in the fields taking care of their sheep. That's hint number one. Now, you see, the Jewish people are or were shepherds, vast majority of them, 
did a lot of shepherding. And it was real simple this way. From April until October, the sheep lived in the fields and in the pastures, and the shepherds lived with the sheep. But from November to March, they took the sheep inside, and they lived inside because of the weather, of course. So hint number one tells me that Jesus would have been born sometime during the time that the shepherds were accustomed to having the sheep in the field. And that would be from April through October. A second thing that we need to uh, consider is that Jesus was born, according to the text, when there was an edict sent out by the Roman leader to have everybody to return to the cities of their birth, all the adults, so that they might tax or take a census of the people. Now, if you are going to take a census, and it was for the purpose of collecting money, it would seem to me that you would want to have all the people that you could get to be there in order to register and be able to get the money exactly as it should be. Why then would you want to set up a time for all people to travel during the winter months when the weather would not be as kind? It would seem to me again that it would make more sense for us to see that that edict had gone out sometime between April and October. A third point, just not necessarily dealing with the exact time, but just notice he was born during the time of Herod the Great. There was a man in 525 named Dionysius Exiguus who decided that he was going to try to find out the date of Jesus' birth. And he pegged that date as A.D. 1, in the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Which, by the way, we should not accept the current PC term, uh, common era. In the common era, meaning the time we live. Before the common era... B.C.E., the times before. You know what's going on there? I want to take Jesus out of it. Before Christ, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Let's just stick with it. I like the A.D. I like that part. And he said that when Jesus was born, that was year one, and he's fixed it at a certain time. The problem is he probably missed it by four, five, six years because he had an improper date for the beginning of the Roman Empire. So really, Jesus was born, according to his calendar, in what would be about 3 or 4 B.C., which makes no sense, but it's how it is. And that was during the time of Herod the Great. That's just more of an aside. But the fourth thing, and the much more in-depth thing, that I, again, turn your attention to the outline to see all of the details. The text tells us that there was, at the birth of Jesus, this is all connected to the involvement, Luke 1, of Zacharias and Elizabeth and the birth of their son, John, who became the baptizer. Now, Zacharias served as a priest in the temple of God. The way this was set up was they had 24 divisions of the priests. And they would serve for a week at a time from Sabbath to Sabbath, each priest. And he would do that twice each year. So those 24 divisions, each priest serving for two weeks, those are the 48 weeks. The other four weeks are the times of the common feasts when the, all of the priests would serve. And that would give you the 52 weeks. And so it would be the case that Zacharias, 
who was in the lineage of the priest Abijah, was in the eighth cycle of priest serving. But it would have been the tenth week because there were two big events during his time. Now, the Jewish calendar begins in what we would call our March-April. That's their first month. And so from their first month, going about ten weeks, we would get to the place where Zechariah is serving in the temple, Luke chapter 1, sometime in June. And in June, what happened? Well, the angel came and said, you're going to have a child. John will be his name. Now, according to Jewish scripture, whenever the priest had finished his week of service, and he went home, a married priest could not resume normal husband-wife relationships for two weeks. It was a period of cleansing. Therefore, the announcement in June that you're going to have a child, two weeks after he gets home is the earliest that Elizabeth could have conceived a child, which means that sometime in July, giving July or August, and giving then the birth of John to be in the March of the next year, which is interesting. Because the Jews had always said that they were expecting Elijah's return at the Passover, which is in that time period. The book of Malachi announces that John doesn't call his name, but talks about the one who became John the baptizer. This one would come in the spirit of Elijah. And the Bible says that he did. Jesus even made that statement. So John was born in the same time frame that the Jews were expecting Elijah to return. He came in the power and spirit of Elijah in March or April of that year during that Passover season. Now, Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary came to see her. Well, Mary, interestingly enough, probably came to see Elizabeth to congratulate her on her pregnancy during this time of the year at the end of December while they were celebrating Hanukkah, the Jews were. And then to fulfill the nine-month pregnancy. John would have been born April, March or April. And since John was six months older than Jesus, then Jesus would have been born at the end of September, somewhere in that area. You know what's fascinating about that? At least in my opinion, John 1, verse 14. Of course, we know in verse 1 that Jesus was the Word. The Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is the Jewish word. Greek word, tabernacled. Jesus tabernacled among us. A tabernacle was a temporary dwelling place, not a permanent one. But Jesus came as the incarnate one in the flesh and tabernacled among us. Do you know this? September 29th is a high day for the Jewish people because that is the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. During that feast, they build temporary housing outside their dwelling and they live there for a week, remembering the time when their people were traveling around in the wilderness coming out of Egypt. 
Jesus born during the Feast of Tabernacles makes perfect sense. If you ever say, I'd like to know when Jesus was born, I want to suggest to you that it would probably be closer to being true to celebrate somewhere around September 29th as the birth of Jesus rather than December the 25th. I don't really wonder anymore when Jesus was born. This is when I think it was. I leave it to you to consider. The second thing for tonight, and the meat of the lesson. Now look at Luke chapter 2 again, and let's consider. I, I wonder this, what was it like for those shepherds after they left the event and they thought back upon it? I don't recall a passage anywhere that shows us or talks to us about those shepherds after the events recorded in Luke chapter 2. I, I don't recall knowing where that is. My suspicion is they sort of vanish from biblical history. But I would like to put myself in their minds and think about what it would be like for them to leave that event, having gone to that place, being a part of that experience, and what would it have been like following that? What would have been on their minds? What did they learn when they came to see Jesus? Let's begin, if you will, in verse number 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Makes sense to me. Have you ever been startled by a bright light all of a sudden? Have you ever been roused from dead sleep, if you will, by just a bright light waking you up? I think that would be startling. I have had it. You've had it. You know what it's like. But this light must have been far surpassing because it was the light emanating from heaven itself. can't even imagine what that's like. And their first reaction was to be afraid. But you know what? When they got home... When they went back to their lives, when they went back to their families, you know what I think they learned in their encounter with Jesus? That it's a whole lot scarier without Him than with Him. I've often wondered all of the details connected to Jesus' statement, let the children come to me, Matthew 18, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean, really? The depth of what it means. I think of some things, but I just have always wondered what the depth of that would be. But here's an interesting thought to me. I, I thought about this in planning for these thoughts. It occurs to me that children are not afraid of God. Children don't seem ever to be afraid of God. When they are little, they talk about God. He, he is their friend. He is just a, a kind person. They don't fear God at all. They live with this acceptance, peace, and calmness about God. It's not until we get older, fail ourselves, learn our own weaknesses, Read about the justice of God and the wrath of God that we might develop some being afraidness of God. Not children. But even as an adult, doesn't it seem to you a whole lot scarier without God than with Him? 
don't know what the scariest place you've ever been. Maybe you got lost sometime. Rebecca and I got lost one time and we were a little bit afraid. And, but we've never been without God. As bad as this world is, in the place where the worst riots have ever been, God is still there. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be in a place where God is not. In fact, wouldn't you call that hell? It's a lot less scary to live in a world when you have a hope and an understanding and assurance of God than to live in a world where that does not exist. I think these shepherds went home and they appreciated maybe for the first time or at least in a renewed way they appreciated that life is far less scary with God than without Him. We continue. Look at verse number 10. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. The angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. I think when they looked back at this encounter with Jesus, they had this thought. There really is always good news available even if you're not looking for it. These shepherds are just minding their own business. They were doing their business. They were living their lives. There they were. And all of a sudden, this great news popped up. Have you experienced in this past year with all of the problems that we've had, has it ever happened to you that seemingly when things were at their worst or not good, all of a sudden you heard some good news and it lifted your spirits. You see, sometimes we can be troubled. We can get in trouble. We can feel like things are not going well. We're not looking for good news. We're sort of stewing in our own juices. But the good news is there, even if we're not looking for it. When these wise men left the presence of Jesus and went home, I believe they understood that truly there is good news if we'll just look for it. And even if we don't look for it, it'll pop up. And boy, don't we need to hear that lesson, that there is good news all of the time. Go down to verse 14. The text says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. When these men returned, when they went home, when they thought about this day that they experienced, I wonder... Did they have a sense and a peace that they understood now that everything is going to be okay? We have seen the king. We've been in the presence of Jesus. Everything's going to be fine. Physically, they weren't fine. The area went through a great period of persecution where all children from two years old and down were killed because the ruler thought that he would, in doing that, slay the one who, in fact, was Jesus because of that two-year window when the wise men came in Matthew 2. It was not fine. 
The Roman persecution, the Roman rule was still there. Life was still ongoing. And you might say it wasn't fine, but those shepherds knew better. They had been in the presence of Jesus, the new king, and now they could say, in the future, when things might get worse, they could say, but you know what? In the end, it's going to be okay. Look at verse 17. When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. It seems to me that when they left the presence of Jesus and they resumed what life they were living, they couldn't help but tell everybody. Because everyone needs to know what we now know. They had been in the presence of Jesus. They had felt what they felt. They had seen and experienced and they knew what was going on. And now everybody needed to know. And they went around telling everyone. I think it is interesting that when we are in the presence of Jesus, when you're in a Bible study, you're in a prayer session, you're having conversations with someone about their soul, trying to help them. Don't you feel that you would just want everyone to know what it is you're thinking and feeling? Man, I'm in a great Bible study, been ongoing for a long time, and, and I just get excited about it. And I want to tell others about what we're studying. These men were the same way. A final thing I want you to notice in verse number 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen it was told, as it was told them. I want you to notice what we read in verse 8. The shepherds were living out in the fields. Verse 20, they returned. What did they do? They returned to the fields to be with the sheep. But you know what? They returned to the fields far different men than they had been previously. That encounter with Jesus changed them, made them different. I can't even imagine that they would go back to sitting there in the fields with the sheep, watching them, and at night seeing all of that starry host and just not even think again about the incredible scene they had been a part of. This verification of the birth of Jesus, the Messiah had really come, changed their lives. Here's what I think they remembered. There's more to life than living. More to life than just living. The theme for this next year that the shepherds and I have been talking about, we're going to use, is live the abundant life. I think that's a great theme following the year that we've just had. We need to talk about the abundant life, not just living, not just existing, not just going from day to day and accomplishing our tasks and our work, but really living abundantly. I want to suggest to you these shepherds left the presence of Jesus, and they returned not just to living, but to living abundantly because they had been in the presence of Jesus. In closing, I wonder this. When I am in the presence of Jesus, when you encounter Jesus, do these things affect you? When you are in the presence of Jesus and you leave that time, do these same thoughts that maybe were the thoughts of these shepherds, do they enter your mind? 
when we leave this time of worship? Do we leave knowing that life is far less scary with God than without God? Do we leave knowing that there is good news all around even if we're not looking for it? Are we people who understand that it's going to be okay? Goodwill to all men and peace. When we leave our encounter of worship with Jesus, do we say, you know, life really is going to be okay? Are we people who leave that encounter of worship and say, I sure wish everybody I know knew what I know? And finally, when we leave our encounter with Jesus in worship, do we return just to living day to day? Or do we return to a life different than when we came in? That abundant life that Jesus wants us to have. I hope that is the case. I hope that you are wise. I hope that I will be wiser. And I hope that we will be in the presence of Jesus and be changed. Thank you for joining us this evening. Always reach out to us if we can help you in any way. And may God bless our country. May God bless our church. May God bless each and every one of us to become the wise men who come to Jesus in worship to be changed for the better.